Good morning. Um, to my great surprise, at least, we're actually running slightly ahead of schedule. Uh, my name is Nathan Brown. I'm at George Washington University, but also a non-resident uh, uh, senior fellow here at the Carnegie Endowment. You can forget that those facts now, because my primary job here is to introduce our three speakers. Uh, we do have some rich material. I shouldn't say we. They have some rich material to present. Um, I had a peek at the papers earlier, and they're very much worthy of your attention. Uh, we do have uh, we do have a very tight schedule, so that rather than um, interrupting each uh, the, the panel periodically with fulsome introductions, I'm going to give you very quick introductions of each speaker and then hand it over to them. They'll each speak for about 15 minutes or so, and that should leave some time for, for uh, a question and answer. And my main goal is to make sure that I keep us on schedule um, since everybody else has been so good with schedules so far. So the uh, three speakers, uh, the first one is uh, Courtney Freer. Um, she got her master's at George Washington University, and before that she got degrees at Princeton and Oxford and places like that. Um, she did her PhD actually there, and is currently a, um, uh, a research fellow at London School of Economics, works primarily on the, uh, on the Gulf. The second speaker is Anel Schilein, who is from, uh, also got her PhD at George Washington University, uh, but she also is currently Zwan Fellow at the Baker Institute down in, in uh, Houston, um, and she has remarkably broad expertise throughout the Middle East. Um, the third speaker has had no association with George Washington University that I know of, but this is not his first time at the Carnegie Endowment. He was actually a junior fellow here some years ago. He retired out to California where he's doing a PhD at a place called Stanford University. Uh, but Scott Williamson has done some uh, fascinating research in Jordan and he's here to uh, present it uh, to us. So let me just first hand it over to uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Courtney. Take it from there. Great, thanks so much. It's great to be back in DC. And I think it's I think it's great to start with the Gulf and specifically with the two Wahhabi states we have in the Middle East, which are of course Qatar and Saudi Arabia. So Wahhabism, I think, is a central element we've had on debates about different strands of Islam and religious extremism, especially in terms of educational institutions, both within and funded by countries of the Arabian Peninsula. The structures linked to Wahhabism, which of course is one of the most conservative strands of Islam, are perhaps the opaquest in the Middle East, which has led to, I think, considerable misconceptions about the religious ideology, its practice, as well as figures linked to it. So the practice of Wahhabism, furthermore, in Saudi Arabia, at least, appears to be changing um, under the leadership of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. So while traditionally the strictures of Wahhabism have influenced everyday life in the kingdom and have been enforced by religious police, this arrangement appears to be changing with restrictions on gender segregation and entertainment recently having been at least partially lifted. Um, and with the institutionalized clergy and police force increasingly separate from the mechanisms of central political power. The underlying, and, and whereas in Qatar we have much less institutionalized links between the clergy and uh, the state. The underlying questions I wanted to address here was were basically, first of all, is, are these Wahhabi states qualitatively different in terms of which religious authorities are followed there? And secondly, is there one type of Wahhabism that exists among these two states which seem relatively similar, at least at first glance? So by way of, of introduction, I suppose um, Wahhabism is of course linked to Salafism in terms of its emphasis on a return to what's considered the original sources of Islam and the Hanbali school of jurisprudence. Um, Unlike Salafism, however, Wahhabism has its origins in the work of 18th century theologian Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, who preached in the central Arabian region of the Najd, um, and at that time forged a relationship with the Al Saud family. And it's from that period that this relationship between the Al Saud, and specifically the Al Sheikh family, um, as religious scholars developed. And that led to the institutionalization of religious authority as we see it in Saudi Arabia. Although Qatar, of course, is also officially Wahhabi, the religious sphere is not similarly bureaucratized. There's no institutionalized state religious authority in the form of, for instance, a grand mufti or even a bureaucratized state ulama. And in fact, most religious authorities in Qatar are not Qatari. And so we don't see this indigenous state-linked ulama in the same way as we have in Saudi Arabia. So in terms of the region-wide survey, which was uh, done in December 2017, we saw some key insights on the influence of Wahhabism. And I think the main takeaway that I found among both countries is that religious figures linked to the state are most likely to be trusted, which is something Qadir al alluded to. So figures from the bureaucratized ulama in Saudi Arabia and figures linked to the Ministry of al Qaf and to the judiciary in Qatar were seen as more influential or more trusted than independent religious figures. Um, so in terms of the, the Saudi data, we had about, we had 2010 people in the, in the data set, about half of whom were Saudis and the other half of whom were mostly Arab expatriates. 
60% were men, 79% had university degrees, over half of them lived in Riyadh and Jeddah, um, and 87% of them went Sunni. So we had a slightly skewed, um, skewed sample in terms of Sunni men uh, based in cities and well-educated as well. Nonetheless, the three most trusted scholars in Saudi Arabia among nearly an equal number of nationals and non-nationals um, were all from the, Saud the, the Council of Senior Scholars, which is appointed by the king and is the only body permitted to grant uh, religious rulings in the state. So the number one most trusted figure was Sheikh Saad bin Nasser al-Shethri, who is a member of this council and also um, an advisor to Mohammed bin Salman. The second most trusted was the Grand Mufti. And the third most trusted was also from al Sheikh family and from the Council of Supreme Scholars. Meanwhile, in the Qatari case, we had a sample, a much smaller sample size of 245 people, seven of whom were Qataris. 90% of the sample was Sunni, 68% was men, 85% um, were Arab expats, and 82% were university educated, as well as 93% living in Doha. So again, we see the skew towards Sunni, well-educated men in, in the city. Um, nonetheless, we saw that the most trusted figures were again linked to the state. The most trusted overall was Wahhabi Sheikh Anwar al-Badawi, who's an Islamic, Qatari Islamic judge and head of the Qatari Islamic judges. Um, the second most trusted was also a Qatari Wahhabi scholar, Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayd al-Mahmoud, who had a major role in putting together the judicial system of Qatar and is now a part of the Islamic Cultural Center in Qatar. So not strictly linked to the state at this point, but still has, has had a role in the judiciary there. Interestingly, the third most trusted figure was Tariq Ramadan, um, who uh, is the European-based scholar and grandson of Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and I don't know whether if we redid this survey since it's recent legal troubles, that would be different. Um, but it is interesting that there's more variety in the Qatari case in terms of which religious authorities are followed, reflecting the fact that the state is less in, in, the state institutionalizes religious authority less so than the Saudi state. And I think this also may be explained by uh, demo demographics. Um, Qatar is 87% expatriate, whereas Saudi Arabia is 27% expatriate. Nonetheless, I think it's interesting that in the Saudi case, where we had a near equal number of citizens and non-citizens, we saw relatively similar um, viewpoints in terms of trusting religious uh, authorities linked to the state. We also, I think as Kadir alluded to, tested, saw how much people trusted seven main religious authorities. Sheikh Yusuf al-Karadawi, who's Doha-based and has been linked to the Brotherhood in the past, um, Baghdadi from ISIS, uh, Hassan Nasrallah from Hezbollah, um, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, Ahmed al uh, Egyptian preacher Amr Khalid, uh, President Erdogan from Turkey, and, and Rashid Ghanoushi. Um, Yes, is that seven? Um, but anyway, and so what we found was overall is that the, the least trusted figures were actually Nasrallah and Baghdadi. We saw different in terms of different results in terms of the endorsement effects where there was slightly more support for Baghdadi, but overall in both Qatar and Saudi Arabia, Baghdadi and Nasrallah were seen as the least trusted. There was also very low levels of trust in Saudi Arabia for any of these international figures, which is interesting. In Qatar, there were only, there was only really marginal, marginal trust for, um, Sheikh Karadawi of all of those figures. So in terms of kind of what this tells us for policymakers, I think there are four main takeaways. First, when it comes to influencing messaging on citizen and non-citizen populations in the Gulf, it's important to engage with state religious authorities since they hold considerable sway in the religious sector and in society more broadly. It's also essential to understand their limitations, however, since their authority is by no means absolute. And I think this is most clearly evidenced in Saudi Arabia by the rise of the Sahwa movement um, in the 1990s and more recently in 2011, when we saw clerics linked to the Sahwa movement um, sign a petition urging for some political reforms. Um, further, state-linked authorities who were m once considered more widely influential across borders no longer wield the influence they, much, they once did, which I think is most clearly influenced by the overwhelmingly negative endorsement effect we saw regarding the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar. Um, indeed, it, it, what we saw is that when he, uh, the, a religious statement that it had less support when it had been endorsed by the Imam of Al-Azhar, which I think is a surprising outcome. Um, as a result, I'd say that engagement with local ministries of Al-Qaf is perhaps the most important means of ensuring that messaging about religion is diffused in a manner that resonates with local populations of both expatriates and uh, nationals. So the roles of ministry remains very much crucial. Second, levers of social and political change in terms of the public practice of Islam and the state's role in regulating it are not likely to be economic in the wealthy countries of the Arabian Peninsula. 
because governments of these states for benefit, of course, from hydrocarbon wealth, they're able to provide handsomely for their citizenry in terms of free education, health care, and uh, handsomely paying public sector jobs. As a result, groups that provide materialists for their followers don't have an advantage over other groups, uh, as we have seen with the Muslim Brotherhood, for instance, in places like Egypt and Jordan in the past. Um, and in fact, when we look at, at where people get religious support in Qatar and Saudi Arabia, it's overwhelmingly from the state. So among Saudi nationals, 12.9% reported they had received assistance from a state religious agency versus 4.5% who got support from the Muslim Brotherhood, 2.9% from Salafis, and 1.8% from Sufis. The results were similar among non-nationals, even though they may have marginally less access to state resources. 8.2% had received assistance from a government religious authority or organization compared to 5.4% from the Brotherhood, 4% from Salafis, and 1.5% from Sufi groups. In Qatar, only 8% in total had sought aid from any government religious agency, followed by 5.7% from the Brotherhood and 3% from Salafis. Again, demonstrating that the government is a primary dispenser of religious aid, both to national and non-national populations. As is expected then, overall there's little need or at least, at least little use made of religious groups for material support in these environments. So for religious organizations to hold influence in these types of environment, they really need to have an ideological appeal or a so specific social function since they can't really benefit from providing materially. Third, uh, which is what I, something I've alluded to, expatriates follow and are influenced by local religious authorities to a larger extent than we may realize or than I quite frankly, expected. It, the fact that most of the trusted religious authorities in both countries were, were state-affiliated reflects either their appeal or the ubiquity of state-sanctioned religious messaging in these Wahhabi environments. What's also interesting is how the influence of state-affiliated Wahhabi religious leaders may undermine the sway of kind of what we would consider mainstream Islamist else leaders who hold sway elsewhere in the region. So for instance, Figures like Rashid Ghanoushi and uh, Erdogan had very negative endorsement effects among nationals and expatriate populations in Saudi Arabia, suggesting that political Islam, especially of the type linked to the Brotherhood, is unfavorable. In Qatar, we saw similarly strong negative endorsement effects for um, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, which I mentioned, as well as for um, President Erdogan, which I found surprising. These results demonstrate the extent to which expats also seem to be swayed by local religious authorities and the degree to which Islamist leaders or leaders of Islamic authorities like Al-Azhar don't really hold as much influence across borders as we may have expected. On a related note, um, the strong negative effect, endorsement effect we saw of religious leaders linked to the Muslim Brotherhood or more broadly to these mainstream Islamist movements may reflect some Gulf governments, especially Saudi, efforts to depoliticize Islam in a way that enables them to strengthen their control over local populations for whom brotherhood leaders may have once held appeal. And I think this dynamic could lead to greater support or visibility for Salafi and Wahhabi figures instead, or general weakening in, in broader terms of appeal to politically engage, of the, politi the appeal of politically engaged um, Islamic groups. Fourth, and finally, the practice and regulation of Wahhabism varies based on socio the socioeconomic, socioeconomic and political environment, which is something Kadir also um, highlighted. And I think this is surprising because we see how flexible Wahhabism is despite the rigidity of its doctrine. As a result, a single strategy to engage with Wahhabism across different countries will likely be unsuccessful, even though places like Qatar and Saudi Arabia seem very uh, similar at first glance. So political and social context matters. Um, despite similarities in religious practice or doctrine. Um, neither state also obviously allows much opportunity for meaningful political reform, yet Saudi Arabia, as I referred to, more stringently and officially enforces the strictures of Wahhabism and it institutionalizes the religious sphere. By contra contrast, in Qatar, we see a largely foreign class of ulama, which is important because this also means that if these people do not kind of hew closely to the state line, they can be deported very easily. Um, Nonetheless, we don't see as institutionalized a relationship between the state and religious authorities or really public enforcement of the social tenets of Wahhabism. Um, so just by way of concluding, I think the divergent religious structures and authorities in the two Wahhabi states of Qatar and Saudi Arabia reveal a number of, of common threads in both countries, such as, as I mentioned, the enduring strength of state-linked religious authorities, the limit of support for Islamist political and social movements, um, and the extent to which expats appear to reflect their local religious environments.
Saudi Arabia, as I've mentioned, is of course unique in the extent to which the religious sector is bureaucratized, which leaves little space for independent religious activity or the support of non-state linked figures. The clear co-optation of the religious sphere, which is illustrated most clearly by the state's employ of clergy, has neutralized the ability of this sphere to challenge the state um, or state um, views on religious practice, in so doing tying the specific religious ideology to both the state and its legitimacy. Nonetheless, the fact that preachers have traditionally been employees of the state with the exclusive power to release religious rulings, independent clerics like Salman al oda and independent movements like Sahwa movement have emerged. And since the rise of uh, Mohammed bin Salman to power, we see both state and independent clerics losing power inside of Saudi Arabia. So the religious police, for instance, no longer has the power to arrest. Social functions like concerts uh, and the opening of cinemas are going forward despite some contestation from members of the Wahhabi ulema. And several independent clerics and activists were imprisoned as of September 2017. Mohammed bin Salman himself, in a famous interview last year with The Atlantic, went so far as to question the existence of Wahhabism his, itself. Um, in his words, no one can define Wahhabism. There is no Wahhabism. We don't believe we have Wahhabism. Um, yeah, clearly, um, a reconfiguration then is underway in Saudi Arabia in terms of the relationship between the state and religious authorities, with central political leadership eager to demonstrate its dominance over the religious sphere. Meanwhile, in Qatar, notwithstanding efforts to in educate an indigenous clergy, the relationship between state and religion remains largely unchanged. Interestingly, Qatar did kind of reassert itself, its place as a Wahhabi state uh, in 2017 by naming its state mosque Sheikh Mohammed ibn al Wahhab, um, something which provoked a lot of outrage inside of Saudi Arabia and actually led to a, a, a letter circulated by 200 members of the ulama proclaiming that Qatar was not properly Wahhabi and that the Altani family had no relationship to the uh, to um, Al Wahhab. So this demonstrates the extent to which links to the cleric and links to kind of Wahhabism as as a proper ideology is important for religious legitimacy of these states, despite the fact that things seem to be changing. So I think just to, by way of closing, the world's two Wahhabi, the Arab world's two Wahhabi states really are not too exceptional um, because of the strict form of Islam embraced in these states. Rather, it's the context that matters. Um, and so we see this in terms of the specific social, political, and economic um, formations of, of Qatar and Saudi Arabia. And so given the results of the survey, I stressed the importance of engagement with official religious authorities and the inclusion of expatriate populations in discussions about religious trends in the Wahhabi states of Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Very much. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all so much for being here, especially after, as Sean said, um, this is not particularly important to the current uh, DC establishment. So appreciate that you're here anyway to hear what we have to say, um, because I think as probably many of you are aware and as uh, the results of the survey show, um, these, these religious leaders do matter in this context. So even if inside the Beltway we've decided this is maybe less of a priority, um, Clearly, this, this does really matter uh, in, in the regions uh, that we're discussing. So I um, st did the report on Morocco. So I'll be talking about three main findings. And then in the Q&A, if you have questions about other aspects, I'm happy to discuss that as well. Uh, first of all, as Kadir had pointed out, um, state religious figures do have more authority than um, what has commonly been assumed. The assumption has, te has tended to be that um, if an, an official is affiliated with the state, it will reduce their credibility because it's typically affiliated with an authoritarian regime. And so what we found in Morocco and largely across the board is that actually official religious figures do have more credibility than we might have otherwise assumed. Um, in Morocco, this is especially striking because the king of Morocco, uh, Mohammed of Sadis or Mohammed VI, is the figure in Morocco with the highest religious authority, which might be somewhat surprising, as I will get into shortly. So that'll be the first takeaway, which is um, King Mohammed VI has, has above and beyond the highest religious authority of Moroccan religious figures. The second interesting finding is that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of the Islamic State, is the figure that has perhaps the second highest religious authority in Morocco. Um, this finding, as I will get into greater detail, but just to explain, this finding was not revealed through direct questions. If someone was directly asked about al-Baghdadi, people would not say uh, 
they considered him a figure that should be looked to to answer questions on religion. Um, but in using the, the survey experiment, using an endorsement effect, when people were asked, um, when, a, when a statement was attributed to al-Baghdadi, people were far more likely to agree with it than if the statement was unattributed or if it was attributed to another person. So we'll get into a little bit more of, of the implications of that. The third finding is that although historically Morocco has um, a lot of different competing figures for religious authority, Morocco historically um, was a sort of a center of religious learning during the Islamic Golden Age. In the contemporary period, we have active Islamist groups, um, some of which are legally uh, engaged in the democratic process, some of which are banned. Um, so the, the king competes with other sort of existing points of religious authority. However, at present, the king is not facing a much competition. This is partly the result of efforts by the king to sort of reduce competition, as well as just some generational shift in leadership of some of these groups. So I'll get into all three of those points in greater detail, and then we'll talk about some implications for, for US foreign policy, if anybody's listening or you know, <laughs> given maybe for the, for the future. Um, so I think the most important thing to keep in mind when thinking about the King Mohammed VI religious authority is it is grounded in a very concerted effort by the Moroccan state to construct this religious authority. I think Sean's point about how religious authority can be made, it can be broken, it can be manufactured, it can be stolen is very important to keep in mind. And so the Moroccan state has heavily invested in a nation building project that holds up the figure of the king as the commander of the faithful, as Amir al-Mu'minin. And this is significant. This does have historical precedent. However, it is best understood as the result of a contemporary and a, a modern state building and nation building process, and is not because every Moroccan sort of has this sense of, oh, the, the Amir al-Mu'minin has this religious authority. No, this is very much the result of, of nation building on concerted efforts through, through education, through the discourse that is disseminated through mosques. So a little bit of history about this, the figure of, of the commander of the faithful. Um, as, uh, again, Sean's point about, you know, it's important to consult the historians, to, to bring more context into this, I think in the Moroccan case is especially important. So um, at the time uh, that the, the French colonized Morocco during the Moroccan protectorate of the early 20th century, the figure of the commander of the faithful had lost a lot of political clout. Although it was the same ruling family that is currently uh, ruling Morocco, has ruled since the 1600s, at the time they were seen as essentially puppets of the French. They'd lost a lot of credibility. And the assumption a lot, among a lot of Moroccan nationalists was as the result, or once the um, Moroccan national movement was successful and Morocco was established, the figure of Amir al-Mu'minin would not be part of the new Moroccan independent republic. That that wasn't, that had no place in sort of a modern Arab republic as we ended up observing with, um, you know, the abolishment of the monarchy in Egypt, for example, in Iraq. Um, however, uh, Mohammed V, who's the grandfather of the current king, managed to survive uh, partly based on divisions within the national movement. He became something of a national figure and so survived the transition, was able to retain his position as head of state. His son then codified the position of the commander of the faithful in the 1962 constitution and then his son, the current king, inherited that sort of religious authority. However, uh, Morocco, as I said, has a history of many different sort of poles of religious authority, many of which are based in Fez, a historic center of Islamic learning. And so the current Moroccan state worked very hard to dismantle those existing sources of religious authority, the existing religious institutions, such that now the, the figure of the Amir al-Mu'minin actually is probably more powerful. He has the weight of the modern state behind him, um, and the, the current Moroccan population has been subjected subjected to decades of nation building that sort of center religious authority in him. So all that to say that when people attribute religious authority to the king of Morocco, I, I think that the findings of this survey that, that, that demonstrate this are valid. However, it, again, it is best understood as a result of, of 
a construction of religious authority. The second finding having to do with Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, as Qadir pointed out, the, the findings having to do with um, high, uh, high support for or high agreement with statements affiliated with al-Baghdadi, we tended to see that result in Tunisia, in Morocco, in Jordan, and in Saudi Arabia, the, the four contexts that were the highest senders of foreign fighters to fight for Daesh or the Islamic State. And it's sort of a question, so we don't have exact numbers on was there an overlap between kind of who supported, who saw the king as a religious figure or the, a source of religious authority and who saw Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi? We, we don't have those exact numbers because again, it was a survey experiment. However, I, I would, my, based on the relatively high numbers, it seems there is some overlap um, or it'd be possible to assume that. And so the way to sort of understand how someone could see both King Muhammad VI as a figure of religious authority and the leader of the Islamic State, I would attribute at least partially to a lot of anti-Shia rhetoric that the Moroccan state has been engaged in. There's, there are almost no Shia in Morocco, but there's a lot of paranoia about Iranian influence. And so a lot of official religious discourse, a lot of religious messaging in Moroccan media have heightened a lot of concern about Shia. And so when the Islamic State also engaged in a lot of this rhetoric, arguing that, you know, the, the um, Bashar al-Assad regime that they would call Shia were attacking, you know, poor Sunni families in, in Syria and that, you know, the, the ruling Shia in Iraq were also attacking poor Sunnis in Iraq. I think that probably contributed to some sense of needing to go and protect Sunni brethren in that part of the world, and that this was a population that was already primed to have a lot of concern about um, the threat of, of sort of Shia aggression. The third major point having to do with the lack of other religious figures in Morocco. Um, so we, we asked about, for example, the current prime minister, Sadeddin Othmani, who had very little trust or approval. We also asked about the current head of the group Al-Adl wa Isan, which is a banned Islamist group that was previously seen as, as a, a, a massive Islamist movement in Morocco. It rejects the authority of the king. It was very much seen as a threat um, to the previous king. However, the, the very charismatic founder died and the current leader has not yet managed to necessarily articulate where the group is going. Um, he's not particularly well known based on what we found in the results. Um, relatedly for the, the PJD, the ruling Islamist party, they were seen as sort of a success story to some extent to come out of 2011 that as a result of reforms that were implemented following massive protests in Morocco, the PJD was able to, to lead a coalition government starting in 2012 and they were re-elected, um, or they, they got a plurality of votes in the 2016 parliamentary election. However, it's possible that the previous prime minister, um, Abdelilah ben Kira'an, was seen as potentially a threat to the king. He was popular, he won a second election. Um, it's possible that king, the king and the mahzen, the elites, the political elites in Morocco, worked to make sure that ben Kira'an was unable to reform a new coalition government. And so after months of stasis and you know, no movement to actually build a new government, the king appointed the secretary general of the PJD, Sadeddin Othmani, to take over. Sort of sidelining Ben Kiran. However, Othmani lacks the, the leadership, the charisma um, that Ben Kiran had. And so there's also questions of kind of what's the future of the PJD given that the, the king and the ruling elites have, a, have essentially sort of defanged them for now. Two other interesting figures are Salafis, one previously affiliate or associated with the 2003 Casablanca bombing, so a, a Salafi jihadist, someone who had previously been engaged in sort of violent rhetoric, who was subsequently has moderated his tone, was let out of jail. Um, the other figure is a Salafi cleric who is not religious, has, or is not violent, has not embraced any sort of violent rhetoric, but has said things like Wahhabi Islam is, is preferable to Moroccan Islam, for example, uh, sees Saudi Arabia as more of a, a figure of religious authority than Morocco. 
However, neither of these figures, although they previously were relatively uh, seen as relatively high profile, not seen as, as sort of significant religious figures in Morocco. So I'm happy to talk more about any kind of specifics if there's any Morocco files who want to dig into the details, but I'll spare the rest of you <laughs> any more details on Morocco. But I think the final takeaway should be um, caution on the part of the US foreign policy establishment in trying to partner with Morocco. Because Morocco's whole narrative is based on this notion of heritage, that the figure of the Amir al-Mu'minin is deeply grounded in Moroccan culture, this, you know, the narrative is that this is a very long-standing figure of religious authority, such that partnering with the United States too overtly could actually undermine the religious authority of the king. Um, when I was in Morocco in 2016 and spoke with U.S. Embassy officials, they were abundantly aware of this. However, it's unclear if current officials have that same uh, level of awareness of the extent to which affiliation with the U.S. can produce sort of an allergic reaction among locals who are very sensitive to this perceived uh, foreign pressure to encourage so-called moderate Islam. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Anel. Thank you. Scott? Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thank you to Carnegie and the Baker Institute for hosting us. Um, as Nathan mentioned, I was a former junior fellow here, so I'm very honored to be back. Um, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, so just for some context, I spent last year, most of last year, in Jordan uh, doing research for my dissertation. Um, in addition to this survey, worked on some other survey work, archival work, um, and did over 100 interviews, about which uh, 25 addressed the contents um, in this report. So I'll start where the report starts, uh, with King Abdullah's very well-polished uh, discussion paper on his vision for Jordan as a civil state, uh, which I believe was his sixth discussion paper since the Arab Spring. And in it, he makes the point, um, because he's very cognizant of the fact that the term civil state has some controversy in the Muslim world, um, that religion will always be an important part of Jordan's value system, that it's in the Constitution. But he's also careful to give a sort of warning that religion should not be used for political purposes by partisan actors. Um, and this is a very common framing in the region where state actors and regimes try to frame the appropriate use of religion um, in this way. And it reflects an attempt to leverage religion to reinforce support for the status quo um, by folding religious institutions into the state and a chance to define the Islamist parties that reflect their primary opposition as outside the bounds of acceptable um, religious discourse. Um, and as Anel mentioned, and as Nathan and Anel and others have talked about in other work, um, it's sort of unclear how well this strategy should be expected to work um, in many countries. Public trust tends to be low in institutions across the region, and frankly, for good reason. And it's not hard to see how, when it comes to matters of religion specifically, um, people might have trouble trusting religious leaders who seem to be dependent on corrupt and untrustworthy authoritarian regimes. Um, since we typically associate credibility with independence, it would be somewhat surprising to see that these institutions seem to have credible authority in the eyes of the people. Um, and in part for that reason, a lot of scholarly work, think, think tank work, policy work, um, has focused on issues surrounding Islamist parties and movements, which are also very important. Um, but there's probably been a little less of this focus on state religious leaders. Um, so what we have seen in the findings mentioned so far by the others, and was also in the case in Jordan, is actually that this isn't necessarily the case and that state religious leaders do seem to have um, a decent amount of trust in their authority amongst the public. If you look through the Jordan results, um, you will see that Islamist and Salafi leaders we selected uh, were trusted by almost no one who said that they already knew about them. And interestingly, they were unknown to a majority of respondents um, in all three cases, whether it was um, the Secretary General of the Islamic Action Front or prominent Salafi and Jihadi Salafi clerics. Um, so that's not a particularly encouraging picture if you are affiliated with those movements. On the other hand, um, the state religious leader we asked about, the Grand Mufti of Jordan, was known by about 75% um, of respondents, and most of those expressed some level of trust in his authority as a religious figure. Um, in a separate survey that I implemented on my own, also with YouGov, I asked respondents about the Amman message, which was propagated by the king and senior state religious leaders in 2004. Um, and this was an attempt to define a tolerant, moderate form of Jordanian Islam, um, both in the country, but also globally, involving 
um, several hundred international religious. Talking to scholars in Jordan, there's a lot of skepticism that this message has any resonance with the public. Attempt that the regime uses this that dynamic. I was surprised by how many Jordanians in my sample said that they had heard of the message previously. When I gave a description of what it entailed, um, which did not mention the king to try and avoid, I was also surprised that two thirds of people. Um, said that the message represents Islam and speaks for them as a Muslim, and approximately 80% said that the message is Taken together, I um, taken together, I think these findings paint a picture in which Islamists are perceived as um, of Jordanian society, while state religious officials possess relatively greater authority Although, as I note in the report, it still appears to be fairly private. Then try and situate these findings in the context of more general Jordanian attitudes towards religion, um, politics, and the state, and the relationship between them. Um, using the polling data in our survey and also from the Arab Barometer, which runs regular nationally representative Jordan and, and other countries in the region. What those results show is probably unsurprisingly to anyone highly religiously observant. And they also strongly endorse some role for Sharia in the country's constitution. But at the same time, um, there does appear to be a fairly strong public consensus against any mixing of religion with partisan politics. For instance, Jordanians really don't want religious officials or mosques influencing voters' choices in elections. And this seems to align with our findings about religious authority that I just went over. Um, because state religious officials do portray themselves as apolitical religious bureaucrats and scholars and judges, as opposed to Islamists that tend to be more openly political. And so just briefly, I want to transition back to our region-wide data. Um, in case some of you are not convinced by these questions where we ask about specific religious leaders or you're worried about people falsifying their preferences, uh, we also implemented something called a conjoint experiment um, in the survey. Uh, we have a rough draft of a more academic paper that we're hoping to publish soon, at least in, in academic terms, um, which <laughs> tries to evaluate the different factors that contribute to perceptions of more or less religious authority. And so the basic idea here uh, is that we create randomly generated profiles of hypothetical religious leaders um, defined by different characteristics that we've pre-selected. And we then ask survey respondents to compare different profiles and choose the one that they think they would trust more in matters of religion. And because these characteristics are randomly assigned, um, it gives us some leverage in, in terms of uh, figuring out which of these characteristics are driving respondents' choices and, and by how much. So we did this several times for all 12,000 respondents who are Sunni uh, and Muslim in the different countries. And it reinforces the findings that come out uh, in many of these reports, which is that respondents in almost every country seem to prefer characteristics associated with state religious leaders. They tended to exhibit less trust in Islamists and Salafis. Um, and they did penalize religious leaders and viewed them as less authoritative when they were described as being openly involved in politics, whether that was supporting or criticizing the government, uh, meeting with the U.S. Embassy, or advocating for armed resistance against the U.S., um, and, and other such things. Um, so going back to Jordan, what are the implications for these findings? Um, in terms of state religious leaders, the pattern suggests that, in fact, the government can lean on their authority to bolster support um, for some of its policies and in some cases. And there are clear examples here, some of which I reference in the report. So for instance, according to former government officials and women's rights activists I met with in Jordan, um, who are not affiliated with these institutions, they do see state religious leaders as playing an important role in, in promoting policies designed to increase contraceptive use, for instance, um, and also contributing to the repeal of Article 308 a few years ago, which um, had allowed rapists to escape punishment if they married their victims. Uh, Nathan and his co-authors have also written about how the Sharia courts played an important role in pushing reforms to Jordan's personal status law. And they did that by bringing together different groups within the society and convincing them that this was the right way forward. However, our, our findings also highlight the extent to which there are risks for the government in overtly politicizing their state religious institutions. Um, when Jordanians show this dislike for politicized religious figures, that doesn't just apply to Islamists, 
but it should also extend to religious figures affiliated with the government um, if they come to be viewed as functionaries for whatever the government wants them to say. So traditionally, Jordan has exercised less control over its religious sphere than some of the other governments in the region, which may partially explain our, our findings about credibility. Um, but in recent years, that has um, changed somewhat, and they've increased their control over religious leaders, doing more to dictate what imams say in Friday sermons, and um, banning, increasingly banning, banning those who stray from the scripts. Um, these moves follow the rise of ISIS, and the government claims, both privately and publicly, that they're justified by trying to fight extremism and cracking down on rhetoric that supports these groups. Um, the problem, though, at least as I see it, is that taking these steps may undermine the credibility of state officials at the precise moment in which their authority is most valuable. Um, if Jordanians increasingly come to see these religious leaders as politicized government functionaries rather than apolitical bureaucrats and scholars, um, their ability to counter extremist ideas will likely be undermined further. Um, and to just illustrate how this increased control might affect credibility, I want to highlight one quote from the report uh, in which I was talking to a Jordanian activist and scholar, and he sort of scoffed and said, um, preachers now talk about respecting parents um, because they can't talk about anything sensitive. And the implication there is that what they're saying seems to be filtered and stale and sort of irrelevant to Jordanians' lives because they cannot um, stray from what they've been told to talk about, and so people just don't care as much. Um, so that's obviously not to say that Jordanian officials should stop trying to crack down on extremism, but trying to control the words that come out of um, religious leaders' mouths is probably not the right way to do it. Um, a reactive strategy is probably more useful where you're monitoring speech and identifying those who call for violence or cross other legal red lines um, while investing in better training and salaries for, for the religious sphere. Um, but in general, I would say trying to encourage the credibility of these officials by giving them independence um, is, is the best way forward. And this suggestion, I think, also has um, implications for U.S. counter-extremism policy in Jordan. So let's not forget that um, endorsing free speech on religious matters is about as American a value as you can have. But if we set that aside and assume that policymakers don't really care about that, um, they should still be encouraging the Jordanian government to relax, relax restrictions on those um, religious officials who give Friday sermons and, and have other interactions with the public. Um, even if that means more rhetoric, on average, that Jordanian and U.S. officials don't like, um, hopefully that increased credibility would, in, in, at least in the long run, provide one of the most effective antidotes to the spread of extremist ideas in the country. Um, and then also just going back to the idea that state religious officials can be effective at influencing social policies um, and public opinion on social policies for any U.S. officials in the country who work on issues like women's rights or public health. Um, it does suggest that building partnerships um, with these officials and engaging with them regularly in dialogue would be quite fruitful. Uh, so just briefly to wrap up, I'll discuss um, implications for Islamist movements in Jordan, which will be the focus of more of the next panel. Um, and the results suggest that Islamists may be caught in somewhat of a bind here. Um, their religious activism is the core message that attracts their political supporters. Um, but the fact that most Jordanians seem to dislike politicized religion suggests a relatively low ceiling on their potential support. Um, if they leave religion behind, perhaps they will alienate their core supporters. On the other hand, if they stick to, to this approach, um, they may never be able to move past a certain level of support. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood and its political affiliate, the Islamic Action Front, has struggled since the Arab Spring. Um, a lot of that has to do with government repression, which has contributed to internal divisions. Um, but, and it did perform relatively well in the 2016 parliamentary elections, um, but it still has very limited political influence. But what's interesting about those elections is that the movement actually position, did try to position itself in a less religious way. Um, it dropped several religious references. It emphasized national identity. Um, it aligned with Christian candidates and took other steps as well. And so it does appear that the movement is trying to follow the path of similar movements in Morocco and Tunisia by downplaying its religious roots significantly. And it will be interesting to see how that um, affects their support going forward. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thanks again. Looking forward to your questions. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Actually, thank you very much, all three, uh, for some uh, for for really uh, uh, interesting set of presentations. Let me just give a very few brief framing remarks and then throw it open for questions. I mean, we've heard three very uh, uh, data-rich papers about four different cases: uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, and Jordan. 
Um, and so we've, in a sense, been very much uh, down in the weeds. But but I hear some very, very strong themes, commonalities coming out of these um, that are sometimes sort of modestly pushed, but it still comes through, I think, very, very strongly. Number one is just the importance of national context. Uh, that comes through very clearly in all, uh, on, in all uh, uh, presentations. Um, second is the tremendous presence of the state in the religious realm. Again, that that's almost a given for the, the, the uh, uh, research that was done. Um, the third thing that to me was um, uh, very interesting is um, the, uh, um, this is going to be complicated, um, Sean Casey made some reference to how authority is almost impossible to define in the religious realm, but um, let me just draw out two quick different definitions because the papers are grappling with both. Authority in the sense of political authority, be able to say that's the official answer. You get a job, you don't get a job. Um, we will teach that, we won't teach that. Um, but there's also authority in the sense of moral authority, that is credibility, uh, You know whether people believe you're giving the right answer to the question. And one interesting thing that I hear is the um, complex relationship between the two, the moral authority and political authority, not an inverse relationship in any of these uh, countries, or not absolutely an inverse relationship, but a complex relationship between uh, the ability to sort of speak with the state authority and the ability to be heard to be giving the right answers. Um, um, there's a complex dynamic in all in all four cases. Um, and finally, uh, to me, what is very interesting is that the, the title of the conference is Implications for U.S. Policy, but in a sense, that was not at the center of any of the presentations. They uh, might sort of uh, uh, dip a foot into that. And to me, there's actually a very strong argument, um, implicit argument, which I'm going to try and make explicit, uh, but, I, but I think that is, that is uniting these uh, presentations. And again, it goes back to some things that uh, um, uh, Sean Casey uh, 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 mentioned in his um, um, a morning keynote. And I do remember actually being in discussions in this building about 15 years ago uh, when, when there was a, the beginnings of a very, very strong effort to kind of grapple with the realities of Islam in the Middle East and, in, and, and broader in the Muslim world. And a lot of the implicit questions was, who are the right Muslims? Right? Are they Sufis? Because they're peaceful. Maybe we need to like align with Sufis and support Sufis. Maybe we need to support LS. Maybe we need to support this group, that group. What do we do with Islamists and so forth and so on? Um, so it was a who question that was dominating the debate and kind of who is it that we talk to? Who is it that we support? Um, and I am going to uh, suggest that we're hearing an implicit argument about U.S. policy um, that it makes sense. It, it, the who question may or may not uh, be a good one, but it's not the first question to ask. The first question is kind of what's going on on the ground um, and what are the relevant actors and what is their relationship, what is their credibility. So we're starting with social and political analysis that is very, very deeply locally grounded um, before we rush into asking about exactly who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And maybe that's that's not even the best question to be asking. So I hear that as an implicit argument, um, um, and that so that there would be very clear implications uh, uh, for U.S. policy um, that if this kind of analysis is 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 relevant, that's how to make use of it. So that's at least what I heard um, and what I read into um, um, some of their comments. Let me now open it up for uh, uh, questions. In the, in the very back. Let me start in the very back. Hi. Uh, thank you. I'm Dave Pollack from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, can you say something in the Saudi case about what uh, MBS claims is a newly tolerant uh, discourse uh, of Islam as the official um, establishment version of that in Saudi Arabia of the Muslim World League, um, Sheikh Al Isa taking a new position on various issues of tolerance, national identity, and so on. Is this, uh, is this credible? Is it having some effects? Is it too soon to tell? What, what should we make of all of that? Thank you. Uh, Courtney, why don't you take that? And Adele's just back from Saudi Arabia. If you have any thoughts, you're welcome to share them. But if you're if they're not sorted out yet, then you're welcome to reserve them for later. Well, I think really what what MBS and I think MBZ in uh, in the UAE also are trying to market is this idea of moderate Islam, and I think that essentially, I mean, it implies that. Islam on its own is immoderate, which is problematic from the start. But it also is this idea, I think, that politics and religion should be separated. And so I think we're seeing that in terms of kind of 
getting the giving the religious clergy less power politically. Um, I don't know whether or to what extent this can can kind of change long term, given the institutionalization of the religious authorities inside of Saudi Arabia. What's interesting is that uh, the Supreme Council or the the Supreme Council of Ulema so far have kind of backed MBS for the most part. And so I don't know whether that will change in the future if he pushes kind of too far. But I think we also see kind of him him tur- turning to two audiences. So on the one hand, allowing women to drive, and then on the other hand, arresting um, female activists, which was popular among kind of some of the more religious, more conservative elements inside of Saudi Arabia. So he's kind of trying to balance these two audiences. So overall, I think it's this idea of depoliticizing Islam, which is important, I think, for him in terms of socially, um, economically, also kind of trying to, to start tourism in Saudi Arabia, but also, of course, politically, this idea that the Sahwa movement is is no longer able really to operate whatsoever, and that was a potential political competitor. But in terms of the long-term implications, I think it's really hard to know to what extent this will, will stick and whether there will be a turning point at which the ulama no longer support him. Maybe just to add, mm-hmm. not... I mean, Courtney is more of an, an expert on this, but I, I was just got back from Saudi Arabia and actually did meet with the, the new head of the Muslim World League, Mohammed Al Isa. Um, and I think in general, the takeaway I got from Saudi Arabia is the Saudi state is trying to walk a very careful line right now in which they are putting forward a lot of policies, a lot of PR around the idea that Saudi is, Saudi is transforming However, they really want to frame it as a social transformation because to frame it as a fundamentally religious transformation risks damaging the source of of Saudi, both religious credibility abroad and sort of the ruling bargain struck between the ulama and the al-Saud. So it's, it's... very interesting to talk to some of you know people like the Minister of Religious Affairs in Saudi Arabia who are again very interested in putting forward this idea that you know Saudi's open for business and Saudi Islam we may have had some bad ideas about it in the past but you know now we let women drive and you don't have to wear hijab and these changes are fundamental on the social level however traditionally those sorts of restrictions were justified on on a religious basis And, you know, things like statements from the High Council of Ulama saying things about, you know, why women couldn't drive and and having a religious justification for this. And so I think the changes to get to your question about should we believe MBS when he says these kinds of things, um, I think the, the changes are fundamental. Saudi Arabia looks very different than it did a few years ago based on Um, everything I I observed and heard from people. Um, This is not just the result of MBS. I think it's really important to keep in mind the effects of the massive Saudi scholarship program. And what I heard was there there was not a single Saudi extended family which did not have a a member that went and studied either in the US or the UK or elsewhere outside of Saudi Arabia. And that program started in 2005. So it's now been 15 years that people have been studying abroad and are now coming back. So I think it's important to remember that while a lot of what MBS has done are seen as you know very quick, it's this young guy, he's making all these rash decisions, but it is grounded in this new generation of Saudis who do very much support this. And I think as, as Courtney pointed out, it is coupled with deep authoritarianism to prevent anyone from criticizing it because this is the Saudi government's future, they have to reduce the size of the public sector and they have to get off of oil or, you know, or that's the end of sort of the House of Saud. Um, And it is also, it is, but it has put the Saudi state in this somewhat awkward position of walking back what it used to justify on religious grounds and now arguing that they are social. But the changes are fundamental, however however you want to frame them. Um, So not, not to jump on Courtney's expertise, but to just reinforce what she was saying with some specific observations. In, in the very, very back of the room, yeah. Very, very. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, maybe I direct this, uh, Steve Winters, an independent consultant, maybe I direct this to Courtney in the first instance. Uh, I don't, uh, I may have missed it, but you don't seem to be placing too much of an emphasis on authority in terms of who's authorized to issue a fatwa. It came up slightly 
uh, because you mentioned uh, in certain countries uh, that's controlled by the state. I, I myself, I, I think in Malaysia, which was way off another part of the world, there's a national fatwa council. And according to the law, the government there, they're the only ones who are uh, uh, authorized to issue an Islamic fatwa. And uh, an, another example would be when Osama bin Laden issued his famous so-called fatwa, there was a lot of discussion about whether he had the religious uh, a training or, or background to be in a position in the first place to issue a fatwa and so forth and so on. So uh, the, the, I just wonder if it came out from your survey, uh, the sense of uh, how, how the populations uh, felt towards uh, you know exactly that. Who 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 they would accept a ruling from, and in particular in terms of the leader of ISIS, who of course claims that authority. So, so I guess in in terms of the Saudi case, the three most trusted religious authorities all came from the senior council of ulama, so the state-linked uh, clergy, essentially. And so, and they, that is the only body that also can technically release with the religious ruling. So I guess that does illustrate at least to a certain extent some buy-in into the institutionalized uh, clerical establishment in Saudi Arabia. Um, and what's interesting is that we see this body being used f as a political tool as well in 2011 with uh, Fatwa saying that you know protests were not uh, legit uh, or were not were not allowed under Islamic law uh, and and also um, we've seen kind of more recently these rulings in 2017 about uh, against Qatar to kind of justify the blockade. So it's definitely also used as a political tool and it seems that at least to a certain extent there is buy-in in that. In the Qatari case, there's not a similar body. Um, so it's it's a little bit more open. Um, but but in, in that case, there was again more, um, the most trusted religious figures were from that religious establishment. As far as Baghdadi, um, he had very little support in Qatar in terms of the endorsement effect and in terms of kind of being a trusted religious authority. Whereas in Saudi, um, Baghdadi ranked very low in terms of um, trust, but in terms of the endorsement effect, we saw that there was there was some support for um, statements made by him. So it's a little bit more subtle, but but it's definitely there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Scott, please. Um, yeah, so there is a national fatwa council in Jordan, and uh, Michael Robbins and Lawrence Rubin have some interesting work showing that its activity actually has increased at moments when. Um, the threat from Islamist mobilization seems to be highest. Um, but we didn't ask about this explicitly in the survey, but I do think one thing that's interesting is that very few people said they actually approach religious leaders um, and ask them for advice or any sort of thing, um, any sort of assistance. So I'm, I'm not sure quite how to interpret that in terms of authority, but it does suggest that in general, people are not going to these leaders um, for, for that purpose. Uh, we're here. We're here. Paul Sedfin, I'm with CNO Resources, spent a lot of time in the State Department working on a lot of these issues. Um, uh, uh, for Mr. Williamson, a uh, question in, in Jordan. One of the things that was alluded to earlier is the sort of poisonous embrace of the United States too publicly reaching out to certain religious leaders or trying to work with them. And that was one of your recommendations in Jordan. That is certainly something that's long term been on the minds of of Americans working there in official capacity, given that despite our closeness with the government, the U.S. government's popularity in our own polling has frequently been in the low teens. So we need to be thoughtful about it. I thought if you had some more comment on if you saw doing this in some way that would, would not soil their credibility, so to speak, by too, being too political or being too much in bed with us. Um, so that's a great question, and I could very well just be wrong here in making that recommendation. So that's a real possibility. And I will mention that in the conjoint experiment I mentioned, um, one of the attributes we asked about was if these, this hypothetical preacher is engaged in meetings with the US Embassy, and you do see some negative effect on their authority there. So perhaps it's not the best approach. Um, but I do know that USAID, for instance, works with lots of partner organizations, uh, local organizations that are Jordanian, um, that run some of these initiatives on women's rights, for instance. And so if those organizations and part of their dialogue are the ones involved in this discussion and engagement, I think um, that would be appropriate and probably not perceived as the U.S. somehow tainting their, their authority. Okay. Yeah. Peter, go ahead. Hi, Peter Mandeville from 
George Mason University. Anel, this is a question for you about Morocco. Um, and I guess I wanted to ask, putting aside specific personalities and, and you know, named figures, one issue that has come up in the policy discussion from time to time is this idea that Morocco, by virtue of the sort of tendrils of Sufi networks and it's just its strong sort of gravitational impact on religious dynamics throughout North Africa, the Sahel, and into West Africa over the centuries, that, that, that the Moroccan religious scene may have considerable influence you know, in other sub-regions of, of, of Africa. Um, and I, I, I wanted to kind of get your sense of that. But then I also wanted to, and I guess this is maybe a mixed Anel and Courtney question. Um, I, I wonder if you um, could comment, and actually Jordan, possibly relevant as well, the question of the extent to which um, some of the efforts that we've seen coming out of certainly Morocco and, and Jordan in recent years as those governments have sought to kind of position themselves as purveyors of moderate Islam, sort of service providers for, for Western security interests in relation to moderate Islam. I've sensed that there's kind of a subtext to some of that that is also about blunting the influence of Saudi Arabia and the Saudi religious establishment in the region, although you know, for, for, for you know, regional diplomatic reasons, it would never be explicitly discussed as such. And so I just wondered if you had any thoughts or, or um, thought, insight from that dimension of it. Thank you. Thanks so much. We'll first do the Morocco question and then talk about Saudi influence. Um, definitely. I think, you know, especially if people are interested in this question of Morocco's sort of broader religious int influence throughout North Africa, I think Anne Wainscott has really looked at this. Her work is excellent. Um, and it's, and again, this sort of gets to, to what our survey findings indicated, which was that the king, the Amir al-Muminin, does have what is seen as, as valid religious authority, and that does extend throughout the broader region. And some of this may be due to sort of Morocco's historical role as a center of religious learning. But it is, again, something that the Moroccan state has actively cultivated with outreach to um, particularly secular African countries, so places like Senegal, for example, which, is, which does not have an official religious establishment. And so when they have concerns about Islamists, they don't necessarily have state employees or state imams that they can turn to to say, you know, don't say such and such in your in your Friday sermon because it is a secular state and they have religious autonomy. Um, and so in cases such as that in Senegal and other secular African countries where they have struggled with this question of extremism, many of them have turned to Morocco or Morocco has presented itself as an actor that can be turned to for services, as Peter described it aptly, um, things such as the Imam Training Center, where people will come from Africa, They've, Imams have come from France, um, Russia was planning to send, may have already sent Imams to be trained in this moderate Moroccan Islam, and then to go back home again, ostensibly to then be able to counteract extremism, but again, sort of increasing Morocco's role and its, its reputation as sort of the center of moderate Islam in North Africa. I'll quickly get to the second question and then uh, we'll uh, allow for, for other insights from my co-panelists. But I think it, it was very interesting both in Morocco, because Saudi is the elephant in the room in so many of these contexts, that anything that, that national, state, religious officials are doing is always kind of at the margins of the Saudi hegemony as kind of the leader of the Muslim world, as also this hugely powerful financial actor that has spread their version through training imams, through bringing people to study in Saudi Arabia, through distributing free Qurans everywhere with kind of their translation. And I, I would argue the Saudi government has checked a lot of that recently, especially post 9-11. There were a lot of concerns. I think Saudi took a hard look in the mirror and acknowledged that maybe some of their religious outreach, which Peter has a, a big program on at Brookings, um, as far as um, sort of religion as a foreign policy tool, Saudi Arabia has pulled a lot of that back and has offered, or this has opened up some space for other actors like Jordan, like Morocco, to sort of present themselves, especially to the West, as these providers of moderate Islam. 
Um, but I, I think getting back to that question about uh, Mohammed al Isa, I think Saudi Arabia is perhaps now moving to maybe retake some of that space and really working hard on this, this branding effort, this PR effort to say, you know, what you heard about Saudi Islam before, that's not who we are anymore. Now we're all about the moderate Islam. Um, and so, you know, I think Morocco has, has managed to build certain relationships in North Africa, also with the EU, and is seen as a very important partner. Um, but they're, they, they, they don't rival kind of Saudi Arabia in terms of both religious authority and resources. Courtney and Scott, you want to weigh in quickly here? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Anel said about, about kind of Saudi having pulled back. I think one thing that MBS also understands is that there has been reputational damage and that he does kind of acknowledge this. And I guess the narrative now is that, well, Wahhabism initially or originally was this very moderate uh, religion and, and it's been, you know, <laughs> changed over the years and, and now it's been, it, it was changed and became extreme and that doesn't have to do with the origins of Wahhabism. And that's kind of the narrative. I think Muhammad Yahya had a a, 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 an op-ed kind of basically stating that that the original Saudi Islam is quite moderate. And so I think MBS is now trying to repackage Wahhabism as this kind of moderate force and force for potentially for, for good, uh, I guess, in the Arab world. Uh, I don't have much to add to what's already been said. Um, this didn't come up explicitly in my interview, so I don't want to get over my skis, but um, it definitely sounds plausible. Okay, uh, let me thank the three panelists. Those of you who have not heard enough, the papers are still available outside and they're also available online. So join me, please join me in thanking the three panelists.